Hi, my name is Wilman Ziada, and I'm a New York City-based director and creator of theater, television, and film, and I'm also a proud Phoenix Global Artist Ambassador. Today, I am thrilled to be speaking with world-renowned furniture designer, creator of stunning Venetian glass. He's an avid painter. He does it all. His name, Thomas Fuchs. For more on Thomas, you can read more about him right below this video. But in the meantime, here is my interview with the incredible Thomas Fuchs. Well, hello, Thomas. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing so great. Well, Thomas, my goodness, you are a Renaissance man, and I am such a huge fan. And actually, I'm going to reveal something. I first found out about you a little late in the game based upon just my obsession with Wendy Williams. And in following Wendy throughout the years, I've noticed that there's a common thread in her Instagram grid, and that is your plates. Talk to me exactly. about, first and foremost, before we get to Wendy, I wanna know, Tom, and, I, and I love the fact that on your website, you say that for you, it's all about at the end of the day, art. And if there's any sort of brand out there that has this sense of fun and whimsy it's classical but it's contemporary edge it's your stuff so i want to know for you where you grew up and when did you realize you had an eye for art and design wow but well, you know the youngest of six children so i was always amazed that even as a small child my parents were very encouraging to all of us and they saw that I was very interested in art at a very young age. So even though I took art in school, after school, they would put me in programs to paint and draw. And uh, then when I decided I was going away to college, um, I basically wanted to be in New York City. So I applied to Pratt, which I thought was an amazing school, as well as the Corcoran in Washington, DC, and then RISD in, um, uh, Right outside of Boston, uh, actually a little bit further north. Uh, <clears throat> so, but the Corcoran offered me a full scholarship and the Corcoran is the first art museum in Washington, DC and the school is actually built within the school. So I started with about 50 kids in my freshman class and uh, studied fine art as well as art history. And I was gonna continue to go on to do uh, studies in Chinese ceramics uh, because I was fascinated by Chinese ceramics and the history. And I, my last semester of college, I did a internship at an auction house. And the position that was available was in the furniture department. And I fell in love with furniture. And I decided not to go on to graduate school because being in the auction house which was an education on its own. Every six months, we had a new auction with 600 new items that I had to research and write descriptions about. Oh my gosh. So I did that. And then after I graduated from high school or after I graduated from college, they hired me. And I worked there for about a year before visiting a friend in San Francisco. And just by, for a whim, I, I interviewed at Butterfield and Butterfield, which at the time was the third largest auction house in the US. And they hired me and moved me cross country. So at 25 years old, I moved to San Francisco, which was amazing. They made me a furniture specialist. And <clears throat> that's where I learned construction, finishes, the history, uh, really did a lot of research on the golden mean, which is uh, considered the perfect ratio uh, for design and the most pleasing ratio for the eye. Um, I could talk more about that later, but it's get, it gets a little complicated, but <clears throat> uh, so I did that for quite a few years and then I left and became a private dealer. And one of my clients was a big decorator in Los Angeles. And he asked if I would move to Los Angeles and develop a collection of furniture with him. And that was my very first collection of furniture. And it was called uh, Quatrain. And it was pretty amazing because there was no budget. Basically, my job was to create the most amazing things that I could possibly create without considering price or anything. So I would do, you know, these, everything was hand carved, everything was gilded, painted, and I would use all the skills and the knowledge that I got from being an, being an appraiser. Because especially with the Italians, they were so good at faking the furniture that I could actually use those skills and create 
furniture based on historic um, important pieces, almost museum quality pieces. So I did that for quite a few years, which was an amazing experience. And that's where I learned to fall in love with craftsmanship. And that has never ended. Every single piece that we do in the collection is handmade. Even pieces that we do on a larger scale still have a handmade element to it. And that's because I personally think that it's so important to keep that craftsmanship alive, especially in this day and age where technology is kind of taking over. And at that point, it was great because I had the money behind me to keep those crafts alive. And obviously we were successful. The pieces were selling. I was creating you know, hand carved consoles that were beautifully, beautifully carved. And not only were they gilded, they were gilded with platinum leaf, not gold leaf. So you know, the console was $33,000 and you know, which I thought was outrageous. And then people would customize it to make it larger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was an amazing experience, but I was living in Los Angeles and I got homesick for New York. So I was talking to a friend on the phone saying I was homesick for New York. And she basically said, oh my God. And she hung up the phone on me. And I thought that was kind of rude that I'm kind of complaining about how sad I am about not being in New York City where you know, I spent my childhood. And <clears throat> she called back a few minutes later and said that her boss, uh, who was a big furniture uh, producer, was talking to John Hutton, who was the uh, creative director of Dongia Furniture and Textiles in New York. And he was complaining that he couldn't find somebody in New York that had his sensibility of this designing within the scale of the golden mean and 18th century proportion. And he wanted somebody with that background. So we met and we fell in love with each other and he moved me to New York. And that's when I started doing more contemporary modern furniture, but based on the golden mean and the uh, classic scale. So that was pretty amazing. And that's also the point where I talked to John about going to um, Venice because I felt like, uh, oh, there's my dog talking. I he felt agrees like, with you. Uh, He's happy that you went to Venice. What? He's happy yes, that you exactly, went to without him. So <clears throat> I felt that the, Venetian glass was being not respected at the level that it should be. I felt that it was more of a touristy trade, kind of trinkets and kind of silly things that they were making, but I knew that they had the skill to do amazing, amazing things. And they were doing amazing things, but just not really available that you would see in the United States. You know, they were doing custom projects and stuff like that. So. Dongi agreed. I went to Venice for a couple weeks and developed my first collection of Venetian glass with the factory there. And again, you know, I was incredibly happy and honored that they had this, you know, American in their midst and that they gave me the respect and the uh, kind of carte blanche to do whatever I wanted in their factory, working with these maestros. And some of these maestros have been working there since they were seven years old, you know, carrying wood to the furnaces. And now they're like 80 years old. But the skill that's in Venice, or Moran, more specifically, the island of Murano, which is off of Venice. And so we created our first collection of contemporary glass. And it was a huge success. And not only was it a huge success for Dongia, other companies like Nancy Corazine and followed suit and went to Venice and Murano and started producing collections of Murano glass, which was sold to the trade. So a lot of people may not have heard, may not have heard about it. And that's because we sell to the trade, which is directly to architects and designers. But um, that alone, I believe, revived the island of Murano, you know, because of the amount of money and work they were getting out of the United States. So I did that for quite a few years, as well as at Dongi, I was developing furniture and other decorative arts, but glass was kind of my focus and um, a lot of upholstery, uh, which is Dongia's uh, you know, signature because they also do fabrics. So you know, working with the fabrics and the upholstery. So it was an amazing experience, but then Dongia, long story short, basically the company was held in a, in a living trust for the mother of Angelo Dongia, who was the founder of the company. And there was a contract that when she died, the company had to be sold within seven years of her death. So I knew that as you know, head of development for furniture, the last thing a company that's up for sale wants to do is spend money on new development and long-term goals. So I kind of, 
imagine that the atmosphere was going to change. So that's when I decided to leave and go out on my own and only do Venetian glass. So I started a company called Otium, which is basically Latin for aristocratic leisure or daydreaming. And it's a beautiful, beautiful word. So the company was OTM. And we had about 13 showrooms all over the United States that we sold directly to architects and designers. We did, we had a collection of glass, but we also did a lot of custom work, uh, especially with the hotels. Like in, we're in most of the hotels in uh, Las Vegas, mostly the lobbies and the presidential suite because of the price points. Uh, we were a big contributor to the Venetian Hotel at the time when it was being constructed. So that was kind of exciting. And so I continued doing the Venetian glass and then, which I was perfectly fine with. And also I love the fact that it was OTM and not Thomas Fuchs because I just wanted to be a tool or a source for designers to produce these amazing interiors. I didn't necessarily need to have my name on it. Lo and behold, you know, I marry Mishu, uh, my husband. And he thought that was the worst idea ever. So he told me to create a tabletop collection that we would sell retail. So this would be the, our first entry into retail. So we're living in New York City and I'm sitting at my drawing table. I still do all my drawings by hand. And as I'm drawing, I'm thinking, okay, you know, Barney's New York is my favorite store in New York, if not the world. And so my collection is gonna launch at Barney's. So I'm sitting there drawing and the whole time, imagining what my collection is gonna be like at Barney's and you know, with, with no connection to Barney's or <laughs> anything. But so I finished the collection and of course I, another long story, I get into the two top buyers at Barney's and show them what I've done. And they could not have been more supportive and more encouraging. It was, it was a pretty amazing meeting. And they basically said, we love what you do, we love your designs, but you obviously have no experience in retail. So there's three things you need to think about. How is it going to look on a shelf? What is the editorial perspective behind this? And it has to be a collection, it can't be individual. So you know, take that, think about it, and then come back and we'll have another meeting. So I took their, you know, I spent the next few months, took their advice uh, and their encouragement and you know, did a collection and brought it to them. And they said, basically, we love it. We're going to take the entire collection. Now you're at Barney's. We're never going to be your biggest client. So go tell everybody you're at Barney's, sell to everybody else, and get your minimums up. So that's when we, uh, we launched at Barney's. And the crazy thing about that is that the first eight deliveries we made to Barney's never made it to the store shelves because the salespeople were selling it to their client out of the warehouse. So we would make a delivery and we would go to Barney's to see it on the shelf and it wouldn't be there. And then we'd make a delivery and oh. so finally it appeared on the shelves, which was very exciting as you can imagine. And um, even to this day, they, you know, even though Barney's has closed, we're still in contact with the, with the buyers. And also when I would have meetings with them about the current collection, I would tell them what the future collections were going to be and what their thoughts were on that. And they would give me, they were very honest, <laughs> which is both good and bad. And uh, some, of my, uh, some of my ideas like strippers and nasty words were a little bit too much. So, uh, but they gave me some great advice and uh, that's kind of where we are today. So, and no, now we're like, now we're doing more uh, uh, online which yeah. obviously is something that's been really pushed for the last two years. Absolutely. Well, Thomas, I love the fact that you even just beginning with, you know, your initial love and interest in the East and then your uncompromising, unapologetic need and want to stick to tradition and not selling out and everything is by the hand, the craftsmanship, the artistry. Obviously, something that is, you know, really, I, I would, I, 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 just in my own studies, really respected more in the East than it is here. And the fact that you bring that artistry in that uncompromising, unapologetic artistry to everything you do, I mean, it just shows, though, in 
the product you put out there. It's not this thing on a factory line that you're getting, you know, number one of five million. Exactly. Everything is custom made. And I hate to say it's like an old school way of looking at it, but it is, it should be the only way. And I just love that you're exactly. unapologetic about that, Thomas. Oh, exactly. And, you know, we visit every single factory that we work with, so which maybe. I think is so important. And we meet the artisans and we, we meet these skilled laborers and it's, it's, you know, selfishly, it's what I want to do too. I don't want to go to a factory where they're doing this mass production and just, you know, here, take this glass that somebody else designed and make it right. bigger and make it smaller. And when we go to India, it's really funny because when I walk in, basically the factory stops working and everybody comes running up to us because they're so excited because we don't tell them just here, take this and make it. You know, we basically, we send drawings that they have to figure out, okay, you know, how are we going to do this? How, how are we going to achieve what, you know, what's in Thomas's head? And it's, it's an amazing compliment. And it's also exciting for them because I'm saying to them, you know, you guys are talented. So, you know, figure out, do the best work that you can possibly do. I love that, Thomas, because you're allowing them as artists to make it their own. And, you know, as a director, you know, I'm not a dictator. I just basically create the outline and you say you color it in. And the fact that you're doing that wherever you go, it's part of your brand. And I also want to touch on something that I think speaks to you as not only a human, as an artist and a businessman, is the fact that, you know, because, you know, your, your partners, your business partners, you know, your husband especially told you, you know, you got to put your name on it, whatever. Exactly. The fact that you consider yourself a vessel, that you are looking at everything you do at the end of the day as a fan of art. And the fact that you still have that childlike wonder of the possibility and even looking at the way that the steps in your career and life, you just went into everything to quote Liza, say yes. You just exactly. said yes. And you figured exactly. it out. And within that, you found your bliss, your niche, which at the end of the day was your truth. And I just, it's, it's amazing. It's incredible. Yes. Now I've been, I've been very, very fortunate to have these, these options laid in front of me. And, and also, you know, it's been exciting that I've been able to take that opportunity and really be successful with it. And not only with myself, but also with these factories. And Absolutely. And, it's, and, it's, and it's I think also you've been given you've given a platform for artists all around the world to use their tradition, their heritage, exactly. their stories that are in their bone marrow through your design. But at the end of the day, they can look at something that's of your design and say, wow, my family's in this play. Exactly. My family's in this glass. Exactly. It's incredible, exactly. Thomas. And we actually have this crazy thing that we're doing. So we just got back from Mexico City and I fell in love with Mexico City. I was a little nervous going because you, you know, from what you see on the news, but the food was amazing. The people were amazing. The culture was amazing. Uh, the altitude is a little tough to get used to, uh, but I just fell in love with the city. And we decided that in October or November, we're going to go back to Mexico and we're going to do a tour of Mexico just based on the indigenous crafts that are done throughout the country of Mexico. And then we're gonna work with those, we're actually have somebody in Mexico helping us line this up. We're gonna work with the artisans there to basically do my designs, but with their, with their crafts. And we're hoping to film the entire thing. So that's gonna be very, very exciting for me. So, and well, we went there, you know, in Mexico City, there's an amazing glass factory that we spent a lot of time with. And, um, they're also very excited that we want to kind of promote the ceramics from Puebla and the uh, volcanic ash carving. And uh, there's been a lot of um, forestry, illegal mm. and legal forestry in mm. Mexico, which has been very sad and devastating a lot of the uh, forest there. And a lot of it's been stopped, thank God, but there are these big old trees that have been left abandoned and we're going to pull those trees out of the forest and actually make things out of them. And the grain that wow. exists inside this wood it basically looks like a Chinese scholar stone. So Thomas, that's incredible. And what I also love, and I could speak with you forever, but my <laughs> biggest takeaway 
from this is the fact that, again, you are a vessel. You are not only creating pieces of art that are conversation starters based upon their beauty and how beautiful they are and attractive they are to the eye, but you've created art, Thomas, that are conversation starters on other cultures, on other traditions, on other ways of craft and um, the other ways that artists from all over the world can express their narrative and their story. And um, it's, it's incredible and inspiring, Thomas, and I'm so grateful to have had the time to speak with you just for oh, a little bit today about it. I appreciate that so much. You know, as, you know, as an artist, you know, we sit in our studios or you know, at our desk in front of our computer or in front of our drawing board, you know, and we have this dialogue going on in our head. And because we're not in the stores and we're not in the galleries, we're not getting that feedback. So when we do, you know, like, you just said, thank you so much for saying that because you know, all I get is my husband yelling at me to do more. Thomas, <laughs> all I get is my husband and one of my two dogs who wanted to just say a quick hello and uh, exactly. a thank you. And, but you know, look at, there's a great Theodore Roosevelt quote that I have also been thinking about lately as an artist during this time. It may be one that you know better than me, but it's all about that whole notion of um, the artist being the one in the arena and that the critics, the spectators, you know, it's easy to mar, it's easy to critique, but when you're in the trenches actually doing the thing, um, it's something else. And you, my friends, since you were young, have been doing the thing. And I think about all of the young Thomas Fuchs out there looking at you and saying, my God, he's not being a second rate version of someone else, but a first rate version of himself, but not only for yourself, but for other artists around the world to say, you too have a voice. And in everything that they make with their hands, it's a story that other people from around the world can celebrate. It's an inspiring thing, Thomas. Oh, exactly. And also, if I had to give advice for, it's, you would say it's a belief in yourself. Really just go with the inspiration and go what your insides are telling you. And you know, you'll find, especially just start. And, something will take over, whether it's your consciousness or whether it's just an unconscious momentum, just start and it'll happen. Amen. Well, Thomas Fuchs, I am so grateful for this time that you took today. Oh, thank you. With me, and I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. So much. Bye-bye. <laughs> artists and bands struggle to make a living. In fact, only a small number of artists can live off their craft. For the 98% of artists that don't have the luxury of being signed to a label, it's tough. But artists deserve to live off their art. Wherever you are around the world, appreciation of music does not change. Phoenix brings bands and their fans together, whilst allowing bands to properly monetize their passion. The Phoenix app will directly connect bands and fans with no need for middlemen. We're utilizing the blockchain to give the power back to the artist once and for all. Join Phoenix, join the change.